My love, Joe, Lani, good to be with you both. My beloved, hello. What's happening? It's Sunday fun day. We've just been hanging out, sweeping leaves. That's your sadhana right now. Yes, it is. Beginning afresh every day. Every day. It never ends. It doesn't end. <laughs> However, it would be an even better sadhana if I didn't bitch about it, if I just did it from the purest part of my heart. <laughs> you do sometimes. Yeah, but not, yeah. not today. Yeah. When you're in the zone. <laughs> yeah. There's work to do on the sadhana constantly. Always. Always. So I've been sweeping leaves, been playing with the kiddos. For those of you just listening and not watching, we've got our daughter, our eight-month, nine-month-old. Eight. Nearly, yeah, eight and a half. Eight and a half-month-old Lani, which you can hear a little bit in the background. She's here with us saying hi. She'll chime in every now and then. For those of you watching, she's right here, down here, right in front of Joe. So, uh, she's playing with doggy. If our conversation is a bit uh, stop-starty, we're tending to our daughter, which is getting, she's getting a little bit uh, ready for her next nap. So she may either get really tired and fall asleep, or she might get really irritable, or she might just chill and be awesome. We will see. We do not know. Do not know. That's an unknown. What's happening? So you've been uh, doing your little wake-up sadhana, which has been awesome. Yes. What are you reading lately? Uh, I'm into the Yoga Sutras at the moment. I find that no matter how many times I study yogic philosophy and yoga history in general, it doesn't really stick in my mind. So I have to constantly bring out the books. So... um, that is my practice. I'll choose a sutra. I'll read a few different translations of it. And then I'll close my eyes and um, discover what's there. It's been beautiful. It's been beautiful to witness. Our little morning routine normally is I'll go and make a chai or Joe will go make a chai. But normally me and I'll bring it in and... Then I'll take Lani for some tummy time and we'll do our own little yoga thing while I rehab my shoulder and she gradually learns to crawl and Joe's been doing a little meditation with Soleil in the other bedroom, which has been really, really beautiful to witness. Yeah, the key is to do it first thing. Mm -hmm. So if I get out of bed, then I often don't put aside the time I'll get consumed with kids and household chores and all that sort of stuff but if I just do my meditation in bed it happens every morning well I think that's really helpful for especially for parents that are finding it hard to get in their practice and I think a lot will really resonate with um that and the the struggle of how to fit in a a disciplined practice, but that's been really working for you. It's been working for me. Our kind of, it's been a routine Mm. that's kind of taken on some momentum and me taking Lani for a walk straight after that while you and Soleil chill and get breakfast happening. It it does. And then you cleaning up the leaves. (laughs) That is the, that, that is the spiritual practice though, isn't it? It's finding that routine that works for you Mm -hmm. and, and really sticking to it. Yeah. We, we, we were talking about Tony Robbins about a month ago, weren't we, or two months ago? Well, that's what got me keen for the cold plunge. That's right. We were all hesitant, and then you brought up the cold plunge conversation with the, Tony Robbins. He, every house that he has has a cold plunge, and he always does it. He, he doesn't um, talk himself out of it. What's that no, word? No compromise. He doesn't compromise at all. And he just does it every morning. And our swimming pool is very cold. 
And so it's more like a cold plunge. And so we've changed our mindset of like, it's a cold pull to it's a cold plunge. It's a, it's a practice of resilience. It's a daily it's practice. Yeah. You've held up that. I haven't. I didn't really commit to the cold plunge, but I commit to a daily meditation. Well, it keeps my pitta in check. It cools me off. and Cools your pitta. It's very good for me. But, um, yeah, this routine has been great, but it's so easy to slip out of it and get caught up in what's ahead of, for the day and get caught up with the babies. But just to incorporate it into the family life has been really awesome. It seems to be working. What about, like, we've got a very flexible lifestyle. Can, can you put yourself back into your kind of grind in the film industry and needing like working so much on the clock because you it's our lifestyle isn't like that much at all now it, it's busy in a different kind of way our managing of the, the the great tag team but for those that are working so much they, they need to be out of the door by 8 a.m if not earlier what do you think should they get up an hour earlier and do their practice or well, yeah, that's what I used to do. I would be in the Mysore room at, you know, as the doors opened. Okay, what about the parents or, yeah, the parents that are barely sleeping so, like yourself? Like myself. <laughs> <laughs> There's always time in the day. Yeah. There is. And if you have that little app on your phone which lets you know how much time you spend on your phone daily... Isn't that frightening? I've been actually surprised by mine. I oh, thought I, I, I've been checking mine out. I've been surprised it's been going down a bit each week. Oh, that's great. So that's been a practice as well. Yeah, of like, letting go of that phone. Well, being efficient with it, mm -hmm. like getting all my shit done yep. at that time I'm on it and then just put it down and, and focus on yep. everything else. I think yep. that for me is it because I know a, a lot needs to be done on the phone yeah. and I want to make use of it, uh -huh. it get it done and put it down That's I think great. it tallies up when we're just on it little bits throughout the whole day true and, that but to answer to go back and answer your question there is always time in the day and you just have to prioritize and it's just like I do a lot of bitching and moaning about the house not being clean but then I've also decided that if I, as soon as I get out of bed, if I just charge it and clean up a little bit, make the beds and put the dirty clothes away, then that's done. But if I leave it all day, then all day it bugs me. So I think a similar thing, if you really want to commit to your spiritual practice, if you really want to commit to uh, whatever it is that you want to feed and grow in your life, uh, first thing in the morning is the best time because the day gets away from you. And I spent years and years of teaching morning classes as well. So for me, that's my best time. I go downhill from lunch. <laughs> I've already peaked. Well, you're not getting your nap with Soleil. You're getting your... Oh, naps during we the would day, but you're nappy not nap it up. Now, no so, uh, naps. I think that has accumulated as well. You cannot nap with two kids. I've been enjoying our nighttime routines as well. Mm. Yeah, getting everything nice and dark and dim, and mm -hmm. and that that family time, that connection of reading the books and rubbing your feet, and uh, we've been doing these little. Because Joe used to be a body worker. What do you call it? The sweep. The energetic sweep. Oh, there are many techniques. <laughs> there are many techniques so in my time, body working toolbox. So over night time, we've been massaging each other. Mainly me massaging the girls. <laughs> but um, massaging the feet and the legs and doing this little uh, energetic sweep. And it seems to be really... It's been really great for Soleil. Um, seeing her just relax to a deeper level. But she loves those energetic sweets. She does. Because we are, we are so hands-on with the baby as mm. we need to be. And she just doesn't have that touch time that she used to have. So I think it's lovely for her to get to get all of that. 
beautiful, sensory, loving, touching communication happening. I think even for people that are by themselves... Self-touch, like another thing we do as soon as we get out of the shower is we, we massage our, our own body with mm. oil, which is actually an Ayurvedic practice as well. Mm-hmm. As um, I mean, many cultures put on body oils for sun protection and all that. So we do that after each shower. So even for people that don't have uh, a partnership touch or a family touch, I think it's really important. And uh, I actually find it therapeutic, as I'm sure you do. Not only just to protect the skin, but just that self-touch, I think, is also really important that can help just soothe the nervous system and get us in the body and present. So little rituals like that of a night time as well, I think, are really good because we're, our nervous systems are just getting smashed by being on the phone so much and all the just copious amounts of EMFs and all that sort of unplug, rub the body quiet the mind yeah a really practical way of bringing yoga into our sleep and i can attest to the fact that you do spend a lot of time (laughs) self-massaging after your showers (laughs) it is a wonderful thing and that is what i really admire about you is that you do put your self-care at the top of your list (laughs) (laughs) and you really no, you, you do all of these things um, which which just take care of your body, your nervous system, your mind, whereas I tend to run myself haggard and then uh, realize, it, then wonder why I'm so grumpy. So it is important to stay on top of it, especially in the family life. Yeah. Am I a grumpy dad? No, grumpy you're an partner. awesome dad. Well, no, I didn't say that you were grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> I said that I was grumpy. <laughs> no, you're delightful, but um, but you do get tired. Yes. You do get tired. And mm-hmm. women are something very unpredictable. And it's just been incredible watching the waves of the cycle and giving birth. And like, you never know what's coming. <laughs> The feminine energy, I mean, Mm -hmm. we have it as men as well, but to witness being around two young girls now and you, just these powerhouse shaktis, Mm -hmm. you never know what's coming. It could be a delightful, beautiful mood. It could be grumpy and Mm -hmm. stormy. Like, yeah. Like the weather. Like the weather. I think David Data uses the weather metaphor for Mm -hmm. um, the feminine a lot, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he does. But it's a great practice to, uh, because sometimes it does get me off guard. um, Because you'll be in a great mood and just (laughs) radiant and joyful and singing, and then (laughs) grumpy about the leaves. But it's awesome. I think it's good to um, be honest with that. Because the old kind of I think model of the the mother, the the wife is like to just put on that kind of same mask and I've got it all together and I'm happy and I'm positive and I'll do anything for you. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. It's very it's very hard to it's very hard to be all things for all people mm-hmm. and I think it's a good thing when you can just you know, show honestly how you're feeling and where you're at, like Lani is right now. Exactly. When she's <laughs> grumpy, everyone knows about it. Everyone Same knows Soleil. about it. Soleil's still got that. But, That's right. Uh, so often, for so long, we've uh, been conditioned into that uh, facade to, to put on, put mm-hmm. on an act. Mm-hmm. So I, I definitely appreciate it. I don't mind it when you're grumpy. Yeah, there's no act. <laughs> there's no act. At least I know what. What's in front of me? You know? hmm. So, where's your passion at right now? You're about to start your podcast. You're speaking yes. a lot about birth and death. You've had some great conversations. Yes. Where's all that at right now? Yes. You're starting to write your book. Yes, I'm very excited about that. Um, I have 
as you know, had a book project that has been on my mind for the past six years. And it is still in my mind, although the last, I would say, few weeks, I've actually put some words down. So that's been very exciting. But yeah, it all is based upon the last seven years of experiencing death very intimately, the death of my parents, and also uh, we had a couple of miscarriages, so the death of two little babies, and also coinciding with the birth of our beautiful relationship and the birth of two of our beautiful babies. So those two things that seem to be bookends uh, are not really bookends for me. They're right smack bang uh, together in the middle. And I've, I'm just so, I feel like there've been amazing opportunities for spiritual growth, for wisdom to come through, just learning about life. And ultimately, I think that that's what life is about. People coming in, people going out. So I'm really charged and energized about uh, being being a support for people and to really help them be present through whatever they're birthing or through whatever is dying in their lives because those things at the moment are, are being clinicalized, hospitalized and are taken out of our hands and and the sacredness of them is not has not been focused on that was a long answer wasn't it no you could keep going can i <laughs> enthralled keep going so i am talking to women who are inspiring to me about their stories of birth about their stories of death and how potentially they have been very transformative events in their lives and I'm going to make those available on a podcast and eventually it's all going to come together in the form of a book The Birth The Yoga of Birth and Death TM <laughs> Stay tuned <laughs> Stay tuned However I do need some of your get it done fire because a lot of my wonderful projects just stay on the back burner as my life force is sucked out of me by this baby <laughs> well i think that is valuable information uh, like valuable sharing for any listeners out there as well especially the mamas that mm -hmm. are they've got the vision or maybe they don't even have the vision they're just tired and they're just giving i mean to honor that because you're, you're literally giving your life force energy you're pouring it all out not to mention how long it actually takes to recover from birth not necessarily all birth processes but yeah for the most part it takes yeah a for lot sure of for sure and let's talk about let, that let's talk about this culture of the bouncing back mm -hmm. bouncing back as though nothing's happened i think that's really immature mm -hmm. there's no going back you you've just birthed a baby you're a mother mm -hmm. there's there's only moving forward in a in a different in a different way you're different your body's different how about honoring that and all of this obsession which i fall victim to of you know oh this doesn't fit anymore oh this cis skin is sagging you know if we all supported each other in celebrating our new bodies and just being okay with where we're at, I think uh, motherhood would be that the, the pressure would would be a lot easier, or you'd feel a lot more supported. I think with a lot of dads being in the room and participating in the birthing process is gradually changing that. Mm -hmm. So we're not. Not behind just the, the curtains of ignorance and, and, and 
thinking, what's the big deal? That's right. Like, seeing it. Uh, Joe and I <laughs> will right. watch the first half or so. The Russell Brand. Russell Brand rebirth last yeah. year. And he was talking vividly about <laughs> his experience of, of watching their baby get born. That's right. And just so vivid in it. And, like the man can see more than than the mama at yes. that time. And, yes. and it, I think it's so valuable to witness that because it's so radical. Yeah, it is it's radical. It's crazy watching... It all happen, and I think if more da- and more dads are involved, it, it's it's becoming the common experience for dads to be in the room and participate. But for so long, it wasn't, which would most likely contribute to that mentality of just get on with it. You know, what's the big deal? I just get on with it. But witnessing the the, the process of it, yeah, um, for sure. There's quite a difference between waiting at the pub having a few beers with your mates and waiting for the phone call that you're a father or being there with your partner as she goes through one of the most physically mentally emotionally challenging things that anyone can go through that opening your body up to to um you know how many times it's it's normal size is is so radical so radical so yes i'm all for the partners to to be there and be in it and to witness just to stand witnessing the miracle of it and everything else. Back to the tired mamas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so watching you have all this inspiration and um, wanting to get these projects done, but then having the, the mama mind, the, the fatigue, just not having the gas to get it done until pretty recently. You're, 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 you can, I can see the motivation kind of being stoked. But until now, like, since the journey of being pregnant with Lani and then the post-birth recovery. You've been wanting to, but the motivation, the energy just hasn't been there. So, um, I think, yeah, speaking more just to that, was it challenging, like wanting to get it done, but just not having the energy, uh, forgetting shit, (laughs) like, or... Was that just part of your practice of just letting go and letting go and just being devoted to the baby? And... If you, this is just a personal experience because I've only been through it with my own children and not been in the shoes of other women, but Tea? no, thank you. <laughs> but for me, up until recently, there's just been very little energy left over because babies are such full-time commitments and they need you for everything you know these little souls they they can't do anything for themselves they're so dependent on us so you really do need to be there for them for me it hasn't been the time to do my own thing it hasn't been the time to you know go out and experience new things or whatever. This has been the time to be in the nest, as we call it, and just to just to be Mama Bear. So again, I, I think that there's also one part of our community who embrace that, but there's also another part of our community who think that you should just get straight back into it and uh, get back out there and work. And it's up for every woman to... I'll just grab Lani. Every woman to find their own way in what's true for them. So for me, definitely, I've been very hands-on. And now I'm feeling that space opening up where she can go longer and longer without a f- without needing me, without a feed. <laughs> She's such a big Buddha. And uh, and just just there's a natural space that's opening up for it. And luckily the inspiration is there 
And that's a really important thing to do is to follow that inspiration. If you have it, follow your bliss, as Joseph Campbell said. And that inspiration has been there for me on the back burner, but it is moving into the forefront. So I'm really going to go for it because I do feel like it's, um, it, it's my life's work. I do feel like I feel that strongly about it. Beautiful. And, um, that in itself, I think listening to the, the balance of it all, the Tao is really crucial. You know, the, I don't think it's a part of nature and a part of our true thriving potential to constantly be creating and constantly be producing work and constantly be out there in the world. But our culture, again, it kind of praises that it, it, it feeds that. And that's what tends to get most of the, yeah, most of the honor and praise in our culture, just uh, accomplishing and uh, working and earning and yeah, so forth. Yeah, productivity, Productivity. So, um, yeah, just to listen to that and to really bring honor to that. And then the, there's like no regrets. I mean, it's such a precious time. And whether it's birthing a baby or an illness or even just a cold or a flu, you know, like listening to that feedback and giving ourselves permission to slow down every now and then and just stop. And yeah. then there's a time to go for it and rock it. And it, it's really cool to just watch you reemerge from the last eight plus months of cooking the baby, birthing the baby, and then watching all this radiant inspiration be poured into creating the podcast, the book, and just all these other things. You've got a lot of clarity on. It's really cool. And then to admit, even though you've been teaching for how long now? 15 years. Yeah, even to admit that, holy shit, I don't know anything. Like I'm reading these books and it feels like I'm reading it for the first time. I think that's actually really beautiful to admit and to even um, cultivate that, that unknowing. Because another thing in our culture with that kind of yang attitude is a feeling that we need to know it all mm. and if we don't know it we feel um inadequate inadequate and um and not good enough and i think a lot of teachers would feel if they don't know all the all the scriptures and all the whatever that they're an inadequate and not good enough teacher but that unknowing that that beginning afresh and just picking up that book even if you've read it 10 times and starting off afresh i don't know shit i think that's actually really potent really valuable well that is true the more you know the less you know the less you know you know <laughs> well, i think that's another Tao uh, <laughs> quote the more you those who those who think they know don't, don't know. know. That's it. <laughs> those who speak, uh, yeah, something like that. Exactly. <laughs> we'll you try know, and find that quote. And, you know what it is. But yeah. it's a good one. It is uh, a good one. We're in a culture where we think knowledge is power, which to a certain extent it is, but it's also quite limiting. Just filling our mind with more conceptual knowledge. Particularly with yoga, when a lot of these things that we are studying are yet to be able to be measured scientifically and are, are really beyond normal cognition. I mean, who really knows the nature of the universe and our place in it? No one does. And it's there's a lot of philosophy that can guide you, but really it's all experiential about, about your own personal observations with it. But really, uh, you, you can't know. These are things that you can't know, but they are definitely good questions to have to, to ask along the way. But I think I'm very comfortable with being in the unknown. Very comfortable. Mm -hmm. The mystery is a beautiful thing. Uh, it's scary, but it's also a, a beautiful thing. Lani's going to play the tambour. 
Now, um, I want you to speak a little bit about how we met mm. and how this all came about. Mm. You and I, for those that don't know the backstory. Well, that's a long one. It's very you short. Can condense it. It's into, very short. I'll tell. I'll give you a little. Uh, I'll give you one of these if you're going too long. Okay. <laughs> well, you came into my life at a very, very turbulent time. I was traveling. I was living in LA and traveling to Perth a lot because my mum had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer, and I was trying to live in two places. I was trying to live in LA and do my thing over there, but also be here for her. And ultimately I had the realization of, you know, the only thing that really matters is being here for her and trying to help her in any way that I possibly could. So I dropped everything from my prior life and I moved here and I was I was in that space of trying to be everything for everyone, trying to, because my dad also had Alzheimer's as well, so he he was of no help. So I was trying to take over their nutrition and, um, you know, be be a be a savior of sorts, and also to. Um, anyway, I was trying to, I was trying to help. I was trying to help. And you had reached out to me a few times over the internet because you watched some of my yoga classes on Yoga Glow. And you reached out again when I was here and we met and just had a cup of tea and we just did a few yoga practices together, didn't we? We did some meditating together and some practicing on the beach, all very innocent. And then there was a ceremony on the solstice of 2012, which coincided with the end of the Mayan calendar. And we were both at that ceremony. And I had a light bulb moment of clarity when you touched my head that you were my beloved and that is it (laughs) yeah that that wasn't too long (laughs) I wasn't even thinking about Gong and the thing and uh, I know the story just as well as you said it (laughs) yeah I think I think what was very interesting is that that at the time there were so many unknowns, unknown about what you know mm. what was going to happen to my parents, and unknown with what was the next move. But with that one moment when I fully received your hand on my head, and I felt the clarity of a yes singing through my body, that that became very obvious that. It, I needed to um, that that you were the one. If there is a one, you're it. The one, Sabek. And then it was a very obvious feeling slash vision of Soleil, and we were to make a baby, and that that was pretty clear right off right off the bat, wasn't it? I had I had never really wanted to have kids. Mm-hmm. And then when you came along there was there was just a there was just a yearning to make a family and I again had never experienced that before. Yeah, so I feel I feel like there was some divine intervention at that time 
And it was a real godsend to have you in my life and to have Soleil come into my life right at that time that mum and dad were dying. It really gave me life to focus on at a time where it was getting just heavy real and real. It was getting heavy and real with you in, in a different way. It was. A different what a, heavy and real. What a potent combination, really. Yeah. It was a pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. And that really became my sadhana as well. Out of nowhere, out of nowhere, I thought I was on a particular path. And then, bang, that was the end of the world for me. Bang. That was a bang. 2012 was, in fact, the end of the world. We're just, uh, for those just listening, not watching, we're <laughs> juggling the, uh, the little Lani going from Joe to me. So that's why we're a bit uh, hiccupy off the mic, on the mic. She's on the boob right now, so that could do the job. Could do. Now, and then with Ramdas being my primary teacher, gradually his presence came more and more into our lives he married us we started going on retreat with him constantly now we're on maui most of or well, a lot of the time do you feel your kind of thrust into writing the book on birth and death the yoga of birth and death do you feel his presence has really fed that or do you think it would have happened anyway just through the profound experiences with your parents and the birthing and so forth i think it would have happened anyway yeah. but it is really wonderful to be surrounded by so many wise elders who are leading the way in those conversations and definitely i'm very excited to share with people some peak experiences of mine of talking to people like Mirabai Bush and also to Ram Das about, about death and potentially life after death, which is just really comforting to, to, to be a part of those conversations. Ram Das talks of a soul pod which is a wonderful thing to think about and he he talks about when you when you die that you become a part of your soul pod which are all your friends and your pets and everything else that's been special in your life you go on to uh collect with those souls and have another journey together so things like that are really wonderful to contemplate because I came uh my upbringing there was no conversations about death or life after death it w and you you really just had to make it up on your on your own or um or it was just a, it was really just a big gaping hole in in mm -hmm. in what i understood about life yeah same here i think that's pretty common in our culture there, there there's just been no talk about it if anything it's been feared like for the most part, just feared. Why, why would you talk about it? And I, I get that quite often when I bring the conversation into classes. Every now and then people will come up and quite disgusted and surprised. Uh, why would you bring the conversation of death into a yoga class? I thought this was meant to be an uplifting experience. Mm. And... Um, I think there's a kind of maturing and ripening from it being uh, a morbid thought and why would you even go there, disgusted, repulsed, to um, it being quite enlightening. And, and I mean, that, that, that's that been a big part of, of immersing in Ram Dass's teachings, is he, his sharings of all those mystical experiences. I mean, he's been around countless dying people and for him, it gradually became fun. He would literally speak of it as being fun, mm. like uh, an honor for one and 
just a, a real spiritual privilege, but then it became fun in a weird way for him. He, he would literally use the, the, that word, fun, um, which, again, in our culture, that would be looked at as kind of um, sociopathic and uh, weird. But he had a mystical experience of being at his mother's funeral and he was on LSD. That was in his L- LSD days. And there's the whole kind of norm of how you're meant to be at a funeral and everyone's in black and there he was in his uh that's when he first started going to india and he was all in his white robe and on on lsd and with his mom in the spirit world and having a psychedelic experience having fun and that was one of his apparent moments that flipped his experience of death it's like well, what's the big deal where we're closer together, but I guess if we don't have the conversation in our culture, we haven't had a mystical experience of life beyond death, if we don't have a practice to connect us to the soul, land, or whatever, I guess, yeah, it would just be scary and a no-point kind of conversation. What do you think? Well, I think that that not everyone is going to be able to take LSD at their mother's funeral <laughs> and have that experience. No, we wouldn't recommend it either. No. <laughs> it could go either way, but definitely Ramdas was just, you know, one of those pioneers who who went who who went there and did all of those things to such a degree. But we can benefit from him coming out the other side, you know, sort of n- nearly 90 years of, of, of being a seeker in this earth. And, and now he, he has the wisdom that it all comes back to love and this loving awareness and presence that is here in this life and is here in the next life and that that you really don't have to worry about saying goodbye forever to your loved ones it's a it's just a change of state it's a change of energetic state um that's a beautiful thing and that's something that everyone can hold on to and i can attest to that and you know i've told you of this experience many times of of me being with my mum who died at her death and that I had this mantra come into my mind, there's only love, there's only love. And the love didn't change when she died, the love was still there. And the love continues to be there. So I, I in a sense, know that to be true. There's only love. But if you haven't had those experiences, you haven't don't have those mentors, you don't have a practice to root you in that, it is good. It's it's a good foundation to seek out those people to find those practices so that you can be supported at that time mm-hmm. so it's not so scary. Because again, it comes back to the thing of really no one no one knows what's gonna happen when we die. But what we do know is that we are all going to die. It's, it's going to happen. Maybe today. Maybe 10 years from now. Maybe 50 years from now. We don't know. And that actually goes back to our conversation that we were having today, doesn't it? When I was sleeping, sweeping the leaves that, you know, your age is, is really just a number uh, even, because who knows when your last breath is going to be. It, you may live t- to a ripe old age or you may not have much time on this earth. So, Yeah, and I think we should remind ourselves of that quite regularly you know um contemplating our impermanence there is an app you can get which is 
called I Croak. Oh, really? And five times a day, it sends you a message letting you know that you're going to die. That's great. <laughs> Have so, you got that? No, I don't. But, um, <laughs> but I heard Mirabai Bush talking about the I Croak app. It's a way to stay present, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think just being a part of this um, global world, you know, being able to plug into everything that's going on, we're fully aware of of death in every moment. We really, we see too much of it. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't think that that is something we need to saturate ourselves with, but more just try to ground and get out of the fear of it and to, to again, just see it as a biological process, mm-hmm. which is natural, which is a part of how it's supposed to be. We see a lot of it, but I think it gets, uh, we distance ourselves from it as them and rather than us yeah. and I, we distance it and we collectively kind of numb ourselves to it. And I don't think it actually is a, a, a bridge into really diving into the contemplation of our impermanence, turning on the news and watching all the death happening, flipping through the newspaper and watching all the death happening. I think, it, I think that can be done in a, uh, a way that can remind us of the impermanence of life. But for the most part, I think it's done from a very distant way of viewing it as them rather than, yeah, the global community, us. Like every minute, like someone is horrifically dying, apparently like getting murdered every minute on a global scale. It's horrific to really contemplate how often someone is dying of natural ways, of horrific ways. Like it's full on to contemplate. And I think every now and then it's a healthy thing to actually whew, like contemplate that, this kind of, uh, as uh, Richard Freeman puts it, the death machine of, of samsara, of, of life, you know, and, and then let that be an avenue to go beyond the fear of it. Cause I even speaking about it at first, there's a kind of, Oh, like, Oh, it's so full on. And it's kind of easier just to separate it and to turn it off and to not even think about it, but then to really think about it, but then feel it. There, there's a breaking open of the heart and there's a compassion and there's a deeper presence. I think it's really valuable to not obsess about it but to every now and then dive into what's actually going on into the interconnectedness of it all and again i think there's a difference between contemplating it and diving into it versus like getting mentally obsessed with it that that just exacerbates our fear but to really dive into it uh can open up a deeper feeling of oneness and and then can also open up the avenue of what's beyond all of this death and suffering and whatnot into the birthing going on every minute. There's every second or so there's more birth going on. I mean, it's, it's full on to comprehend the, the yoga of birth and death, like on a collective level. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a radical thing to do every now and then. Mm -hmm. And I think psychedelic experiences can bring that about of like, wow. But to do it on a kind of mundane level, on a moment to moment level, I think is really good for our compassion, our connection to everyone, not just people we love, but also people we hate. They're going to die. They could die at any minute, you know, and they were a little baby at at one stage as well. And they had parents that conditioned them. And just to have a, a more global interconnected awareness, I think, can come from that. For me, I feel like becoming a mother has opened up my heart so much more 
It's such a vulnerable place to be in when you have a baby inside of you and you really have no control over who who it is and if they're healthy or not. And all you wish in your heart is that they're a healthy baby and you know only too well that so many people do not give birth to that healthy baby of their dreams or you know it 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 ends that there is no baby at all and being that parent and putting yourself in the shoes of other parents who who have that experience is really excruciating and it makes you it makes you really pause and reverence to those people who are going through that, but also to um, to be grateful and celebrate if, if for the healthy child that we have had. Mm-hmm. And not that I was cold before being a mother, but I just don't think that I had I had mother's compassion mm-hmm. that that you do. You realize how vulnerable and dependent babies are. Um, it's inconceivable to think about babies that are ill-treated, uh, children who are abandoned, and you can really see how that sets them up for a life of pain. And you can really see how people can grow angry if they're not nurtured in in their throughout their you know those formidable years of their lives so i definitely think it is a a good practice to to bear witness to other people's experiences and also just to sit in gratitude for the blessings that you have in your life because mm-hmm. you certainly can't take them for granted. Yeah, I agree. And further speaking to that and again bringing in the teachings of Ram Dass, um, I remember him speaking of a couple that are in his Sangha like back in, back in the 90s. I don't know if they still are. But um, they were expressing their predicament of their child that was uh, disabled. I can't remember exactly what, but some uh, some disabilities there that were really stressing them out, and they were expressing that to Ram Dass, like you know, the kind of why why us, why me? We did everything right. Just that that conversation and just sad, confused, just everything that would come with it, of course. And then I uh, recall him giving the advice well they all went into like a meditative state and contemplated it apparently and it got revealed to him that the disabled son was actually a very conscious being high being in a previous life that literally chose to be incarnated into a uh, into a disabled body and to have all these certain difficulties to actually ripen in his parents a a deeper level of compassion that wouldn't have been there otherwise, a deeper resilience and compassion. And I remember Ramda speaking to that. And um, I think that's also a tricky practice for... I I work with um, some parents that have children with uh, learning difficulties and disabilities, and it's such an intense practice for him. But I keep remembering that conversation Ram Dass had with his uh, Sangha and their child, just remembering the mystery a little bit more, remembering the mystery a little bit more, remembering to quieten the mind and connect on the levels beyond form and, yeah, entertain the mystery a bit that uh, what is this rather than just why me, which is often our default in our culture when shit goes wrong and it's not ideal, why me? Uh, the contemplation of what, what, 
what could be growing through this, what could be blossoming through this. And I think it's really important to recall that in those challenging times and quite possibly some of my students that are in that situation. I mean, we speak about it all the time. Not that I have the answers or anything, but it's just a contemplation of, okay, there's a shit on the surface and it's totally not ideal, but what, where can I grow in this? Where can I open? Where can I find a bit more compassion? And it always happens, you know, when, when one, one like lets himself cry and lets himself go through the sadness and the frustration and the suffering and just empties out, there's always clarity after it, you know? So yeah, celebrating when it's all good. We're so lucky that if shit hits the fan, as it often does, it always does <laughs> eventually. That's just the way of form. Form crumbles away. Being able to uh, inquire into it and quieten down. And another example, I know it's a, another sad example. And again, again, the Ramdas Sangha, uh, we know the couple and uh, their daughter was um, 11 year old daughter, I think at the time, was raped and murdered on the, on her way to playing tennis. And they came to Ramdas like, fuck, like, Mourning, of course, mourning as heavily as you could imagine. It's got to be one of the worst things to go through, losing your child. And she was raped and murdered. And his response to that was you're being, of course, it was tears and compassion, but then the just wisdom of you're being forced to bear the unbearable. You're being forced to bear the unbearable. And that was her legacy beyond the surface of like uh, the unexpected, you know, just absolute horror, raped and murdered. You're, you're being forced to bear the unbearable. And um, I mean, he's got just teaching after teaching of situations like that, that just, you don't see it coming. Horrific. Um not at all what you would think of as like a conscious death, but the unexpected. And I think in, in the conversation of the yoga of birth and death, it's also good to um, develop the awareness to uh, bear the unbearable. Because, I mean, what you would have gone through with your parents would have been quite a bit of that, of bearing the unbearable, of like, what in me can't handle this kind of constantly dies because all that, all that is left is the you that actually can handle it. Yeah. Yeah, you have no option but to go through whatever is there. You can't escape it. And what we can do is we can be there and support our brothers and sisters who are going through those horrific things. Uh, we can wake ourselves up that we're not immune and in a bubble of light and those things can't touch us. They touch everyone in every moment. And we can just stay open to the process of life in whatever way it comes towards us, no matter what, because this is this is the life school. This is the school of hard knocks. We are not little flowers that blossom by the first light, and you know. Just well, I think we are that as well. Gently get <laughs> blown by the breeze, and and you know that sometimes, often, that we get cracked open and it's uh it's quite radical but again if you look back through the rich history of spiritual traditions across the board these moments where we're tested these dark nights of the soul are really the fertilizer for that next evolution and we and and it's in those moments that we get to just peek behind the veil of life beyond this 
reality. I, I was, <laughs> I was looking at the great wise oracle of Facebook not long ago, and someone posted something about. Well, I think it was a Native American tribe. I'm not. I'm not going to remember it rightly, but the sentiment I remember is that people in that tribe revered grief and the person who was grieving they saw as being very close to spirit because their heart is attached to that person that being that is just moved beyond this realm and i think that that is a wonderful thing that we can bring into our culture really supporting and 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 revering those who are grieving and to and if it is your own grief just to really inqu- inquire to really go to where it takes you beyond beyond this beyond this life beyond this little mm-hmm. form yeah and i think um that's super important and again, back to our kind of societal conditioning, most of us have been taught in one way or another to get over our grief as soon as possible or... Yeah, right. And Just get on with it. Gee, that's convenient, isn't it? Just neatly, oh, you know. And, and, and to miss the whole, to miss the whole wonderful, wonderfully deep and painfully um profound time uh, is 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 really wasting that moment because you know you know when things when things leave you when things die that you have that you get that little insight into that wake up call that life is as we know it is brief very brief very brief all there is is love we really went there didn't we we did that was deep that was deep but it's good i think these are really good conversations to bring to the forefront and to not get scared about the conversation and keep inviting ourselves into those contemplations. Mm -hmm. And every now and then I feel myself grip in speaking to it and listening to it and just further going into the practice of, of breathing into those places of us that get scared and that contract and grip and just continuing to dive in. And, And it can be scary for sure. There's no denial of that fear and, Again, just getting more honest with the grief and the intensities of life, I think it's crucial. You know, it's so so easy to create these comfort bubbles and just, just focus on having fun, which is good. We want to do that. We we love our Sunday fun days. Mm-hmm. And this is our Sunday fun day. We're having fun with this. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels again similar, uh vibe to what Ramdas was speaking of is like having fun around death. I think that can be taken a bit too literally and a bit it can be heavily misperceived. Like it's a different kind of fun. It's a depth that we often don't tap into if we're just uh sleepwalking through life. It it jolts us into being so deeply present and that's what's fun. Ram Dass often speaks about when he's with someone dying, he's in the face of truth. You know, it's just raw truth. And Don Juan often speaks about keeping death over your, on your shoulder, just right there. You know, So it's just that. We're having fun and it's beautiful. You've got a sleeping baby on your boob and it's beautiful. At the same time, right here is uh, death and it's okay. So like taking the heaviness out of the conversation, even though it is heavy, it's a heavy conversation. Yeah, it is. And um, a couple of those examples I brought up are really heavy and it's kind of easier not to talk about it 
at the same time, it, it, it's kind of helpful to talk about it because there's always someone not far from us going through shit, so much shit, if not us, like, yeah, I was just about to bring up another heavy example, but I think I'll leave it. <laughs> I think I'll leave it. We'll go on a, on a lighter tangent. Yeah. Or do you want to keep going heavier or deeper? No, no, but I do love Ram Dass and Mirabai Bush's latest book, Conversations About Death, Walking Each Other Home. And I do love that term that Ram Dass has brought into our um, consciousness of walking each other home. And I think that's a really beautiful way to leave that conversation is we are all just walking each other home. And some people get home sooner than others but definitely that is all of our destiny is is that is that transition from this life into the next into the unknown into the mystery back into the void great way to leave that conversation to the soul pod but i do want to keep our conversation going especially yeah. now that lani's asleep yeah and my boob is just exposed oh you're good i'm like <laughs> Lucky uh, Yoga Glow fans to get to see another side of Jiv Testula. <laughs> no, Glow. Yeah, yeah, they've they've evolved from ten years of Yoga Glow now to into Glow, and are bringing in more diverse practices rather than just Yoga Asana into their platform. So it is a really exciting time to be with them and to be a part of the. The GLOW, the GLOW team. I do love that you shared how we met and included the Yoga GLOW portion of that because it it drops a lot of people's jaw and I think it, it sparks the imagination that I was practicing with you on Yoga GLOW and then all of a sudden we make a baby, but it wasn't quite like that. It was actually very, very innocent. I loved, and I still do love, uh, Joe's classes on Yoga GLOW, yoga glow and I did practiced to them a lot loved it uh was having trouble finding um classes that i wanted to go to and that was a go-to on yoga glow so uh yeah i dove into that gradually realized she was from perth and it was actually like you said very innocent and i just loved your way of teaching well I thank you and I think what was really special about that time is that yoga I feel like yoga in LA at that time was was very exciting and dynamic and there were a lot of teacher teachers wonderful teachers in a very small area and a lot of innovation and just real energy into the practice and what I think happened with Yoga Glow is they were able to tap into that mm -hmm. somewhat and we were able to share what was happening at that time in LA out into the greater community. So even though you weren't there at that time, you definitely got um, a sprinkling of it, a little taste of it. And now it's just gone, it's just gone bonkers. Yeah. Every, it, it's the online learning platform is mm -hmm. here to stay and uh, you can learn anything online and it's really very exciting. It is exciting. Do you think there is a potential flip side negative aspect to that? Do you think it's stopping people from getting out there, being with the teachers face to face which has an undeniable potency to it a transmission of being in the presence of of the sangha of the classroom of the community of the teacher do you think it is stopping that much or do you think it's just adding to the learning i don't think so yeah. i really don't i don't think there's any substitute for no. it being together you know in the physical form but definitely I feel like you can have community uh, via technology as we are having right now to the people who are listening to mm -hmm. us in their homes, in their cars, on their walk, however they're tuning in. And we're all connected and 
you and I physically in this point in time, but to people in the future. And that shared experience is bonding. Mm -hmm. So although it is a bit diluted, it's definitely there. And I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm not poo-pooing it because I've, I've, I've been um, connecting with people via technology for over 10 years now. And I get out into, um, you know, no matter where we go in the world, inevitably someone will come up to me and say that they practice with me at some point. And that's a beautiful thing. L.A., the yoga scene has drastically changed. We go back there a couple of times a year and not only has XL closed down, but just the whole kind of, I mean, a few years ago it, and the peak would have been, when do you think the peak would have been? Oh, I think, I think the early 2000s would mm -hmm. have been the peak in, in that you would have classes which were at capacity mm -hmm. and, all day long. All day long. Yeah. So, you know, you'd have to go early to get into certain classes and there would be 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 people taking a single yoga class and it was a very, very, um, yeah, vibrant time to, to, to be in, in the scene. So I was really grateful to have been there real time because it been was a great wonderful. experience yeah it was a great experience incredible teachers mm -hmm. everywhere would have been a great vibe and what was great about it was being amongst a lot of people who made their sadhana their spiritual practice such a big part of their life whereas how we grew up and and the situation of the culture as a whole in, in our upbringings did not bring put spiritual growth at the forefront of their lives. So it was really exciting to be a part of such a broad community that were cleansing, which were talking about diet and nutrition, which were talking about um, nonviolent ways of living, which were talking about, um, you know, how, how the body is a, a vehicle you can you can tune it to high states of awareness and consciousness and what is yoga and all very exciting things that I knew somehow I ha I knew that I was lacking that sort of thing with 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 my prior life before yoga and then when I found yoga and I found this community of people who are all seekers, it all made sense to me. Yeah. Beautiful. And since then, I mean, Exhale has closed down. Yeah, it's that, all, it's that all was kind a, of transformed, hasn't it? That was a wonderful studio in Venice Beach uh, where I taught for eight years that had a lot of really great, wonderful teachers, such as Shiva Ray and Eric Schiffman and Sean Korn and Annie Carpenter and Max Strom and Saul David Ray. And, I mean, these names may not ring a bell to some people, but to a lot of people they will, and they were really, um, you know, integral in my um blossoming as a yoga teacher but it is shut down now that's right it's now a spinning place yeah interesting watching these uh new fad routines and exercise routines and whatnot mm. arising because i do you think at the time i mean it's undeniable that there's been a fad aspect to yoga mm -hmm. do you think that was part of the fad of yoga peaking back then it, it seemed like something deeper going on but it did feel like the fad peaking and now it's kind of at a different phase collectively i think there were a lot of true seekers and are and then i think there are a lot of people who just dabbled and mm -hmm. and were semi curious and have now moved on to the next thing which is fine mm -hmm. which
which is fine because the as it has been throughout history the yogic life is not for everyone it's not for everyone it's it, there's a lot of work involved in just constantly holding a mirror up to yourself and that deeper inquiry of who am i i mean it's 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 qu- it's quite a rigorous practice at times do you think that can be done at f45 or a spin class yeah it can be done anywhere and mm-hmm. in fact i was reading a sutra today uh which was translated that you know there are some people that don't need the yoga practices to be in a state of yoga mm-hmm. but those people are rare but there are definitely people who don't need these these bodily practices and these mind practices and they can be in yoga at any moment and any time and that of course we know that that is available but for most of us we need to do the cleaning and the preparation and and, and just be relentless about that i do love those people that are in a beautiful just beautiful oh, yeah. state yeah you know, it's you know, easy for them it's easy it's just and, their nature yeah because and we laugh about it every now and then it frustrates us as well they kind of uh more i guess you could say shadow aspects of the community and the seeker and the kind of ego aspects of ourselves that can creep into the yoga community mm. and um yeah, I, I definitely do love meeting people that are in what we love about yoga and they're not even talking about yoga. I find it very refreshing. Yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> uh, it, it's one thing to practice the the beautiful practice of yoga, but then to take it too seriously and yeah. to turn it into the just old competitions of the ego, mm-hmm. that is something that does irritate me for yeah. sure. <laughs> Now, um, are we going to let people in on our secret? What's our secret? I don't think we've got any secrets. What it, if it is a secret, it's no longer. Okay. okay, reveal it. The secret that this is actually not the first podcast that we recorded together. Yeah. We actually did one before, but I asked you to trash it. It was New Year's Day. <laughs> we were super tired and relaxed and... I thought it was a great podcast, but Joe thought it was a bit too sloppy. and <laughs> It was pretty loose. It was very loose. But this has been pretty loose as well. But I think uh, I, um, it's hit the, hit the point a little bit more. <laughs> I pulled the spouse card that it needed to be trashed. Yeah, I've never let anyone uh, have the choice to delete a podcast, but Joe had the privilege. So you're not like a usual guest. There's another example. You're not like a usual guest. Thank you. (laughs) What it was, we we had started to talk about Ashtanga Yoga and we started to talk about Patabi Joyce and about what is currently happening, um, revelations of um, inappropriate touch and uh, misconduct from, from... him to students and so we would we were talking about that and what I didn't like about my response is that I started talking about it without actually really giving it time to think about what my experience was and that realizing that we can do that we can often talk about things that we've heard but not really um, making time to to study what our actual experience was. So you've had a couple, you've had a month, <laughs> you've had a month so had to a, reflect and uh, refine. I've had a month to think about it, yeah. And it is great that we can talk about these things it's great we can uh delete the podcast if we don't like if we don't like if if i don't like what i'm gonna what comes out of my mouth 
So you, we're uh, an hour and 20 in. You better get this one right. I'm not deleting this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have brought it up. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so what I do want to say about that is, number one, it's wonderful to, to have – to be at a point in our culture where we can now talk about these things and they're not just dismissed because before, quite frankly, if you talked about misconduct from a senior teacher, it was not addressed at all. It was not given the light of day. So the fact that uh, people are being listened to and that there are now seeming to be consequences from those actions, I think it's a very good thing. Now, I did practice Ashtanga for many years in the 90s and I did go to Mysore and after my time in Mysore, I then stopped practicing Ashtanga yoga and I I really had to had to go back there and it was a long time ago it was over it was 20 years ago I have to think about now what what was my experience and why did I stop so Number one, I did get injured and I think that was partly because of the heavy-handed adjustments from the teachers but I also think it was partly the willingness of of my willingness to, to please and I thought the what you were supposed to do was to push yourself as far as you ca- you could and beyond. And there was no talk about um, if, if it hurts, stop, or, you know, don't, don't push beyond your edge or any of those things. It, none of that was talked about. You, you, to me, it seemed like the further you could push yourself, the better you were at your yoga practice and people who were very flexible and pushing themselves into very uh, strong postures were seen as advanced. So I gave that a go. I pushed myself as far as I could and ultimately I ended up getting injured. And I I do take responsibility for that. But also I think there was definitely a culture from the top down that was one of heavy handedness and uh, not a lot of there was not a lot of restraint yeah have I answered that question now you did <laughs> I didn't even ask the question, but thank you for readdressing it. Readdressing it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I felt like I should. It taught you a lot, though, didn't it? It, the, it, it was a valuable time, even though it, you felt your body kind of breaking from it. It, it taught you a lot, those Mysore days, didn't it? It did teach me a lot. It taught me to listen to my body. It taught me that... Um, not all teachers are worthwhile giving your time to. And I felt that very deeply in the Ashtanga system. Unfortunately, even though a lot of people revered Patabi Joyce personally, after practicing with him personally in his home in Lakshmi Puram in Mysore, I felt that it just wasn't a place for me, that, that what I had experienced to be yoga mystical and magical in my own practice was not what was transmitted when I actually went to Mysore and did those uh, and did the practice. It felt very hierarchical. It f- felt very competitive. It felt very judgmental and unsafe. And, you know, really I did think of Patavi Joyce to be, you know, an old Indian man who was sort of like a kid in a candy store. Mm -hmm. That, That was sort of the vibe 
that I I got and I didn't like it. But I definitely was there and participated in it initially. I was willing to um, to push myself to injury, but um, learned some hard lessons. Yeah, it seems uh, the age of the guru. Like, of course, it's changing with this new empowerment coming forth of people not not feeling like they need to do every single thing that the guru says. It does seem like that dynamic is changing in good ways and in bad ways, kind of like the uh, the master-disciple relationship that can be really beautiful, like the one Ramda speaks of with Maharaji and like mm-hmm. that whole das Kula Sangha speak of with Maharaji. And it seems uh, with this new movement, and especially with a lot of the more negative, uh, abusive things coming forth of, of what has happened to people, it seems like possibly the, the baby is getting thrown out with the bathwater a little bit um, and everyone's becoming their own guru in good ways again and in bad ways. You know, people are finding their own autonomy and people are studying themselves and getting on the online archives and becoming their own guru in a way. I do think it's great to have mentors and master teachers to check in with and mm, to stay accountable, mm-hmm. to stay accountable. And sure. I think that was one of the roles of these old school guru types. They like just kept everyone's egos in check big time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it just kind of, it got taken out of control and egos crept in and got inflamed. And we, we see it left, right and center, like in, in so many different communities where it's been a thriving, flourishing system. And people are feeling empowered and growing and evolving then like the, the, whether it be the sexual abuse or the, dysfunction of one sort or another just leads to it crumbling down again that's one thing i appreciate once again of the of the das sangha the ram das sangha is like there's been that kind of old model of guru disciple yet very little of the hierarch- hierarchical stuff that you just described yeah. and that's so common the kind yeah. of co- competition and hierarchy and um, abuse. Yeah. Yeah, so it just calls upon us to have discernment Discernment. to who we give ourselves over to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Right on, To to have these master teachers, to have these mentors, to have someone to check in with seems to be really valuable. Yeah, my my... My knowledge in this field is whoever points you back towards your own heart and your own inner wisdom is a teacher worth listening to. Those who take your power away and make you feel bad about yourself are not are not that worthy in my opinion. I agree. I guess it's just tricky if in our nervous system all that we know is of the kind of old old model father figure that's telling you what to do, maybe not making you feel good unless you're doing something really good. I think a lot of people then project that onto their teacher as to someone that just tells them what to do. Well, that's why conversations like this are really important for mm-hmm. people to hear to to be empowered to listen to that part of you that's saying this doesn't feel right mm-hmm. this doesn't feel good this feels abusive mm-hmm. this feels like my power is getting taken away this i feel like i can't do anything without this person yet i feel misappropriated by this person mm-hmm. so i think that it's really good to have these conversations that if you feel that, well, then that's definitely something that you should listen to. Mm-hmm. I do love how 
fired up and honest about that conversation Mark Whitwell mm. gets and yep. him being a senior teacher and pretty much in the role of master teacher, senior teacher, yet he's constantly handing the power over to the student and yep. constantly talking about that the guru is really just a good friend pointing you in the right direction, you know, again, walking each other home. And I think the guru role is still a powerful, a powerful avenue. And I, I do still think there are guru types, well, but that, I think it's changing. The dynamic is changing. That's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. I think real gurus are few and far between, and there are a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing, or there are a lot of people who are claiming to be masterful when they're really not. So to when you do find the real deal, you'll know it. And you'll feel it in your heart, which is what we get to bask in with being in the Ram, Ram Das community is that they did find the real deal and the love that was that was magnified through their guru still, we, we can still feel that today. And it's a really powerfully beautiful thing. So maybe it's in your dharma, maybe it's in your... Um, your destiny to have a guru or maybe it's not and if it's not then that's okay as well we can still we can still live magnificent lives the gurus are in disguise as well the gurus are in disguise you're my guru you're my guru too no disguise though you're just it Sometimes I'm a grumpy guru. Grumpy guru in disguise. Yeah. Well, that, that I think I want to speak to a bit as well. Mm. I think the the common misperception at, that the guru or even just the yoga teacher, the spiritual teacher is meant to be this constant perfection. But even Maharaji, even Neem Karoli Baba was known to be a little rascal mm. and to be swearing and he was fat and he'd be throwing fruit at his disciples. That was their prasad. And he was known to be a little rascal of a, but he was a saint mm. and he was enlightened and he was masterful. And I think there is a common uh, glorification and glamorization as to what these gurus actually are. Cause he totally kept again and again, uh, breaking the stereotype, which I appreciate those conversations as well. Yeah. He wasn't, he, he was known to transmit a lot of miracles. He was known as a, a miracle saint and had a lot of those, uh, cities, those yoga, yogic powers, but he was also a little rascal, just giving people shit and throwing fruit. But the main thing was love. That was it. Love. All there is is love. And he was oh, a total transmission of that and i think uh many teachers many yoga teachers fall into that trap of uh trying to be constantly perfect and i, I think it's good to strive for a, a nice amount of mindfulness and just being good mm -hmm. but our little rascal within i think it, it, it's fun to allow that to be Alan Watts would often refer to it as the, the salt in the stew. The salt in the stew, you know. We've all got a little rascal that's just like, it just adds a little substance. Mm -hmm. Ram Dass would speak of it as being like his neuroses, it's just his style. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So, like, even with Ram Dass and that Sangha, we see like the more neurotic sides to. Not so much him. I mean, he, he, he speaks of his neuroses still being there, but he just speaks of it as being his style, <laughs> which I like. <laughs> We're allowed to be neurotic. We just yeah. uh, learn to not take it so seriously. For and, sure. Uh, For sure. We can just salt the stew a little bit. The stew. The stew. The steward. <laughs> All right, babe. Well, I hear Soleil, so we better wrap this up. Okay. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Uh, come on in, Soleil, and we'll wrap it up. Joe, is there anything else you want to mention to the listeners or anything? 
No. 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 I Thank do. you all for listening, and um, um, I love you, even if I've never met you. There's only love. You're amazing. Check out Joe's work on glow.com. And uh, I'll leave links below to the things that we referenced, Alan Watts and Ramdas and Mark Whitwell, people that we deeply care for. But yeah, hop on to glow.com and check out Joe's classes. Like we spoke of, I am her biggest fan and advocate. <laughs> so uh, check it out. And thank you for listening. Much love. Mm-hmm.